This is Pamela Kuhn, and the curtain is up on Center Stage, the show about the arts and the artists behind their work. At a time when the hammer has come down on the funding to English National Opera in London, one can worry about the fate of the art form in a country where the arts are generally government funded. But opera companies are an ever-developing myriad of potential, and many times the most effective and enjoyable form of opera can come in the guise of smaller companies. Those who have hands-on control of artistic integrity and a grit about getting things accomplished. They aren't sitting and waiting for government funding. They are finding the ways and means to put on fully realized productions with complete artistic control. And such is the case with a small but significant company in London. Regent's Opera, formerly Fulham Opera, has been designing large-scale operatic productions on a smaller budget. And their recent child is a production of Wagner's Ring Cycle. It has been the focus of musical director Ben Woodward for some time, and opening night is already upon us. Das Rheingold was presented in London at the Freemasons Hall in central London on November 13th. And today I have with me Ben Woodward to discuss the road to the ring. Ben, it is so great to have you back on center stage. Welcome and congratulations. Well, thank you, Pam. It's been <laughs> it's been quite a ride these past couple of weeks. <laughs> it really I, has. I would say past couple of years. I mean, you have been a busy boy. Um the so the the um the story of it went that um back in 2018 i was doing an opera gala and we decided as when this when we were still fulham opera that rheingold was actually how it all started so i started an arrangement of the opening scene of rheingold uh for 15 or 18 instruments um so that was back in 2018 i just did the opening scene Mm. And then, so that was there and nicely done, and it worked very well. Um, and then, I live in Germany now. I live in Berlin, and um, in at the end of the lockdown, well, at the end of the first lockdown in twenty twenty, um, Caroline Staunton, who is now directing our Ring Cycle, she said to me that she would like um, she would like to do a Valkyra Act One. It's like the first thing out of the gate when we were allowed to do it again, and so I arranged that as a single thing. It took me about six weeks, six or eight weeks because I just, you know, just went for it. Um, and that ended up never happening because the kind of lockdown went from everything stopped to everything open again and th there didn't seem to be any need for it anymore, which was a shame. But um, it kind of set this idea going that maybe we should actually do a ring cycle together, Caroline and I. Um, and uh, I'd got quite a lot of the pieces already in place. Uh, um, uh, Cat Woodward, my wife, uh, as you know, as one of your own protégés, uh, now absolutely ready to sing Brunhilde. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we were like, well, why don't we do this? And so I carried on and I finished Rheingold and we started making this master plan that this was what was going to happen. It's been one hell of a ride trying to find the venue and then figure out our way around the venue and how what you can and can't do in there. Um, finding some funding, of course. Um, all of it is either private or ticket monies, um, which so there's no government funding for us at all. Um, we can can or cannot talk about DNO and all the rest of that later, perhaps, but. Uh, I had two or three very generous donations of four or five figures, uh, which meant that, okay, we've got enough seed money. We can start this. We can do this. And then uh, and I put together the cast. We got everything together. And indeed, it opened on Sunday. It was... Um it was it was pretty emotional in its way. <laughs> it's, it's been a roller coaster ride. Yeah. Listen, before we go on, I want to talk, go back to fundraising again. You're uh -huh. doing this on your own. Now, not everyone in the UK has the talent to do this because you're used to another kind of process, really leaning on the government. But one thing about you, Ben Woodward, is I know you have that Herculean ability to be able to go out and fundraise, and you do that yourself. You don't really rely on many others. 
Well, the, the the government funding in the UK is a strange thing. It all works through a body called the Arts Council. Um, and there are various institutions such as uh, the Royal Opera and ENO were on this thing as well, where they the Arts Council provide money to things. And we've had a few grants from them on a project-by-project project basis. Mm-hmm. But they haven't been interested in this one, which is fine. Um, but as far as private fundraising is concerned... There's this very funny, um, this English English kind of terribly English thing of, oh, I don't think I can ask for anything. I don't feel I should ask for anything directly. Why would I possibly do that? The um, the, um, the hilarious thing at university was um, me saying to you, would you like some wine? Which actually meant my glass was empty and therefore I w- wasn't asking for it directly because that would be too... <laughs> too really... But you've got to throw that out of the window. Um mm-hmm. Um, and just actually downright say to people, I need you to give me some money, please. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember back in university, I read Mozart's letters, which are hilarious. I recommend them to everyone. <laughs> um, and Bach's letters, which are slightly more functional. Um, and two, three hundred years ago, the vast majority of Bach and Mozart's letters were asking for money or <laughs> telling people they owed them money or um, or mm-hmm. basically asking for commissions to do stuff. Um, this has been what musicians have done for centuries. And once you realise that and sort of get over yourself, then I can say, OK, I need the cash to make this work. Could you please give me? And then the only kind of art form in it is asking for the right number, <laughs> for asking yeah. for the right person. Um, you know, there are plenty of people out there who I've just sent an email to all the people who came to the show saying, would you like to become a friend for £75? Mm-hmm. Whereas if I can find the right person, I can say, I think you could probably give me £5,000. Would that be OK? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And usually if you get that number right, usually they say yes. You know, I love it that you've shared that about Mozart and Bach and their letters asking for money. You know, this is something we can't forget as artists. We we have always struggled, literally, to keep our art afloat. And there is no shame in that, in the asking for support. And of course, you've had time in America. You've worked in America, so you've kind of got that that American mozzi, you know, that, yeah. that helps <laughs> a, a, along the way. This is fantastic. Yeah. So I want to go back a couple of years to when you were the head of Fulham Opera. Mm-hmm. I always feel in a rather satisfied way that I had something to do with that because I remember saying years and years and years ago to you, start your own opera company, put on the ring. And you did. And we did. It's true. We did that. Um, the I'm, the ring, the initial, the initial formation of Fulham Opera in 2011 came about because our... Um, uh, an American tenor. Let's go. Let's let's tell it this way around. An American tenor mm-hmm. friend of mine. He was doing. He came over. His sister was living in London. He came up to visit and do a recital. And he put Wintersturmer in front of me, big tenor aria from Valkyrie, as well you know. Um, uh, and that was my first experience of it. And he puts this piece in front of me, and I started playing it. I was like, "What is this? I need this in my life." <laughs> um, so. Um, so that was one thing that happened. Then um, we put on a, a Christmas performance of Amal and the Night Visitors, uh, which was sort of part of the church's music programme, uh, sort of, you know, the Christmas master plan, but it was, it was pushing the boundaries of what was reasonable in terms of a church context. And uh, a guy called Robert Presley was the central, the middle king, who is not Balthazar, not Casper, the other one, I can't remember what it's called. Um, Melchior, Melchior, that's his name. And uh, Robert said to me, let's, I want to be Alberich, let's do Rheingold. And so this, um, I was like, never want to look a stupid idea in the face. You know, it's it's like, this is actually the right thing to do. Let's do Rheingold, let's make this happen. And on that occasion, back in 2011, we did it on a profit share basis. I said to them, right, we have no idea what's going to happen. Uh, we'll have tickets at £10 each. We will have as few props and as few costumes as we possibly can. And we will be, I will be absolutely transparent. And everybody in the cast, and indeed myself, will make the same amount of money from it. Perfect. We all, 
And we all, well, you say that, after three weeks of solid solid uh, rehearsals, uh, we all made about £80, pounds, which was, you know, not a lot of money for three weeks' work. Um, but again, it set the ball rolling. And right. then and people loved it. And they said, well, are you therefore going to do Valkyra? And we were like, well, I guess so. <laughs> um, um, <laughs> sure, why not? Um, then things got a little bit more difficult because Siegfried and then Goethe Demmerling is very, they're both properly difficult pieces to put on. Uh, but we did that in, and, uh, and then we did a full ring cycle in 2014, putting all four operas together in a week. And that was with just me on the piano. Um, mm -hmm. We added a few instruments here and there, but um, we did that. And, um, and I think we're the first fringe company to do that and make an actual profit. Um, Wonderful. That, um, that was in this little church in Fulham. And then over the intervening years, we've done lots of big productions of things. We've got more and more sponsorship. We've got more and more following. It has grown fairly organically, actually. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we've done quite a lot of Verdi. We'd, um, the thing that followed the ring was Falstaff, which is where I met Kat, because she auditioned for it, and we had a showmance, and that was that. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Um, uh, we've done Don Carlo, the full five-act version. Uh, Simon Boccanegra um, and then uh, in 20, well it was supposed to be in 2020 of course but happened in 2021 we branched out into Strauss and did uh, Die Egyptische Helena um, and oh and we also did in 2019 we did Die Meistersänger and that was bonkers that's you know the full thing um, full chorus um, in a in a proper theatre in uh, near London Bridge, so at that point it started to move away from a small church in West London. Right, right. Um, and then the story goes that in twenty twenty, um, there's a guy called Nick Heath who was running something called Regents Opera, who I had worked for in a sort of like ad hoc way, uh, which were a touring opera company, um, and. He got COVID very badly and felt his own mortality and also felt he wanted to retire from doing that and um, and give it a legacy and make it carry on. And so Nick said, would I like to take over Regent's Opera and merge it with Fulham Opera? Mm -hmm. And this became a no-brainer to me because... Um, Regent's, Regent's Opera doesn't have a, a, a geographical name to it. And he called it that because he lived next to Regent's Park. But um, it's just, um, it is non-geographic and we could go with it and do whatever we wanted with it. Right, right, right. Um, so we are now Regent's Opera and we are giving the Ring Cycle in Covent Garden, less than 300 metres from the Royal Opera House. Yeah. <laughs> You're giving them a run for their money. You certainly are. Listen, a couple things I have to bring up right now, because this is really significant, mm -hmm. is that you do all of your own arrangements, scaling down. You, 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 we're doing these large scale productions, right? But you have to scale that orchestra down to a reasonable number, which A, you can pay for them and you can actually really control, you know, financially. You do the arranging for this. And we're talking, we're not talking folks out there listening right now about small, intimate opera. We're talking about huge, full scale works. How do you yeah. do this then? How? Uh, um, it takes an, it takes an enormous amount of time. Um, I, I wake up very early in the mornings um, and I go up to my office um, and I put all these things into a computer. I've switched from Sibelius to Dorico as a, the, the software, um, mm -hmm. which isn't terribly important, but I did. Um, and I put it all in note by note. Um, there are quite a few people out there who sell these kinds of arrangements of these big pieces, but what they tend to do is to just push the wind parts down and leave the original string parts. You can't really do that. You can't really do that with, especially with Wagner. But um, actually, I don't think you can do it with most of these pieces because yeah. when composers just decide, oh, we want the cellos to split eight different ways, um, 
then how is a group of just 15 supposed to deal with that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I rewrite everything. I rewrite the string parts I, um, so that all this stuff works. Um, I try and keep Wagner, especially with Wagner, I try and keep his colours as close to the original as possible. Right. Um, if you've got a clarinet melody, then it will still be in the clarinet. Um, the difference is if you've got three clarinets um, making a particular colour, then I will have to do something with the other two clarinet parts. So perhaps second clarinet makes its way into the viola and the third clarinet might make its way into the bassoon. Something like that. Got it, got it. And what is your orchestration for this? You have 18 instruments plus organ, correct? Yes. So the um, so there are nine string players, two firsts, two seconds, two violas, two cellos, one double bass. Then four winds, one flute, one oboe, one clarinet, one bassoon. Then I have three horn players playing two horn parts. So in Wagner's original, there are eight horns, four regular horns and four Wagner tubers, and they kind of interchange and intersperse as he feels he can. Um, and that's kind of one of Wagner's main things is using these, these horn sounds. And it is absolutely exhausting for them if you just try and do it on two. Right. So I have a third player, a bumper, they call it here. I think there's a different word for it in America. Um, but we call it a bumper. Uh, and that means that the horn players can switch in and switch out. Then I have one trumpet and one bass trombone. Um, and the organ is in the ring just because there is one of the finest organs in the entire country in the Freemasons Hall. It is marvellous, it is colourful, it is brilliant, it, every note on it works, <laughs> which is rare for organs. Um, and the secret which is now very much out is you first hear the organ as the dragon so i love it so when alberich transforms into a dragon about two-thirds of the way through scene three this you feel the whole floor rumbling because it's mm -hmm. in the organ it also means that the orchestra and indeed i can have a glass of coca-cola <laughs> <laughs> This is a real kind of Richard Strauss moment, isn't it? I mean, really, you know, yeah. you you get so much size out of that that organ. Uh -huh. Wow. I, uh, tell me, Ben, are you just the kind of guy who just says, I'm going to do this and you don't see barriers? I don't see any at the moment. Um, <laughs> I don't, I think... I see that there are, I mean, there are issues with it. There are very big issues. Mo many of them are financial. Um, some of them are logistical. Absolutely. I don't think any of them are musical. I believe 100% in my team, my cast, mm -hmm. uh, my director. Um, Caroline is, you know, she's just bringing such a, a great feel to this ring. I mean, in recent times, we've had... You know, Richard Jones has now done two aborted rings. Uh, um, Stefan Herheim at uh, Deutsch Oper has done his. I can't remember the name who's, of the guy who's just done it at Bayreuth. Uh, the Cherniakov ring at the Berliner Staatsoper. Mm -hmm. These people are all men. <laughs> and I, I mean, my previous ring cycle was directed by a woman as well, but it's so important to try and get some sense of not this is just a, a guy thing yeah Go. the feminine the the goddess feel to to all of this um, um tell me tell me about caroline staunton um caroline is a genius in her way um absolutely she is um she's irish <laughs> um she is a staff director at the staatsoper in berlin she's just assisted on the cherniak offering um, and I would say that our ring cycle is completely the opposite of the Jenny Arkoff ring. Um, she has an encyclopedic knowledge of opera and an encyclopedic love of it as well. Um, Wonderful. Uh, she knows the texts of all these pieces in any of four languages, um, including Russian. <laughs> um, just merrily quotes it at you in the original and says oh do you mean this bit and then it can make connections in her oh. brain um she's a profound profound talent and her expertise in the room i would say is more about is and she's got the whole package but the one thing which she does better than anyone else 
is getting text and relationships between characters to be really crystal clear. Um, and the 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 thing that we've that we've seen in this particular production has been uh, the relationship between Fazalt and Fafner has been really carefully crafted, and it just leaps off the stage. The two the two of them are you know they're so beautiful together. Um, Henry as Fazalt is about six foot seven, isn't he? Uh, he's a very big lad, and Craig, who is Fafner, who ultimately kills him, is probably five foot five, which is quite funny. Um, but the way the two of them act together on stage, it's got that. Um, what are the names of the characters in Mice and Men? Lenny and yeah, yeah, yeah his I... his. What's his cohort, yeah. yeah, that was brought up in one of the reviews actually yes, about this production, and it it really does have that thing about it, and that's what Henry's gone for, and that's the, I say they've Fantastic. worked really hard to make that work. Tell me about the rest of your cast, Ben. Um, well, the um, the leading the leading group uh, is Keir Watson uh, as Votan. Um, well Keir... known on London stages, yes, mm -hmm. uh, he's. And um, I don't think he'd he'd have a problem with me saying that I kind of reinvigorated his career in 2014 when we asked him to be our Falstaff. Mm -hmm. um, our original Falstaff dropped out uh, on less notice than anyone needs and Keel was sitting waiting for the phone to ring and it hadn't rung for quite some time um, and came and gave a brilliant Falstaff and then... Uh, I asked him what he would like to do next with us. Uh, so he's also done The Dutchman. And then he was a Hans Sachs in Meistersinger. Yes. And uh, then, and this, he knew it was coming. The three Votans, he knew they were coming. And he is someone I'm absolutely championing. I think his voice is, he's just one of the most expressive people I know. Yes, he is. He is. He's fantastic. Um, so there's Keel, Ollie Gibbs, uh, who is kind of my business partner in Regent's Opera. It's mm -hmm. Alberich. Now, um, I say aforementioned Robert died in 2013, but um, and Ollie came on board at that moment uh, to fill Robert's shoes, and boy, has he done so. Um, I think this somewhat, well, as directed by, but sort of pushed and pushed by Caroline, this is the best performance I think Ollie has ever given. Mm -hmm. So, so I understand. Yeah. Um, uh, then uh, the third of the main characters is Lorga, <clears throat> and uh, uh, people must think I'm mad by hiring thirty-year-old to sing Lorga, but James Shouten is going to be—he's uh, going to be a name yeah. on the operatic stage. He really mm -hmm. is. He has taken this role and run with it, and then some. And it's a voice. This is a real oh. spin. Oh, and hello. What a personality on stage. <laughs> he is hilarious and he's just rejoicing in this thing. Um, so along with them, um, I've got Ingeborg. I don't know how to pronounce her last Danish name. Um, Ingeborg. Um, <laughs> uh, Diplomat as you are for your cast, yes. <laughs> uh, I uh, she is a marvellous, marvellous Danish lady. Um, uh, Kat met her at a Wagner competition in Denmark and they were very rude to her and said, you will never sing Wagner. And I was, and I listened to her and I was like, yeah, you will, because you're my fricker. <laughs> yeah, you will. Um, and again, her chemistry that they've created with Kiel, it's it's so sweet. The The two of them have this the love coming off the stage is, is really palpable. Um, uh, my three Rhine maidens, Gillian Finnamore, uh, Justine Vianney, and then May Haydorn, they're, they're just really proper, brilliant voices. Um, Caroline has gone down quite a dark road with the opening scene. Um, oh. And it's not, it's not just flirtation, it's Alberich being really quite unpleasant to them. Um, and yeah. I mean, I would say they've gone down a road which is, I've made, I've mentioned The Handmaid's Tale as being kind of a ah. palpable a, a, a thing that people know about these days. Okay. Um, and so the three girls, they found themselves going to quite dark places in the rehearsal process um, for this for that opening scene. Yes. 
and that's that's really pushed them and I I think that's been an interesting part of the process certainly um, May is also singing Erda and I think it's one of the most beautiful things I've ever heard mm -hmm. um, and I've heard that aria in auditions hundreds of times and she is heartbreaking with it mm -hmm. um, absolutely heartbreaking uh, I've mentioned Henry and Craig the Giants and I've also got uh, Fro is a guy called Calvin Lee, who I met in Berlin. <laughs> he's just this enormous honk that he makes. He's, and he's <laughs> so funny on stage. Um, one of the reviews said, is he auditioning for Siegfried? Yes, I, I read that myself. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, well, perhaps he is. Perhaps he is. Um, uh, then Andrew Mayer is doing a lovely job as Donna. Uh, he's... Uh, uh, he's really having to find a different character than what he's useful, used to, so that's mm -hmm. quite fun. And then I think, finally, uh, Holden Madagame. Um, Holden describes himself as a trans ambassador. Um, he, um, uh, he is now a tenor, having been a mezzo at school in America. Um, and um, I just adore having him on the team he is such a joy an absolute stage animal you know if, if you say jump he'll say yeah absolutely brilliant this is great let's do it <laughs> and, um and he's made mima into something you absolutely remember whereas often that scene with mima it's about eight minutes long and it is it can be completely forgettable but his performance has just been joyous absolutely joyous so uh, I, I just I just want to interrupt here for a minute because you're talking about something that is close to me, and that is when one can find a happy production like this. I mean, you're describing Holden really bringing something incredible to every moment he's on stage and in the rehearsal process. Mm -hmm. You and I know that's very rare in the world of large opera houses. And quite mm -hmm. often, you know, there's an element of bitterness or uh, no one's getting along with the, the stage director. I mean, a whole host of things can happen. But it sounds to me, you know, again, one of the joys of these m smaller companies is that you guys are doing it because of your own hunger and your love for your art form. Um, I would say family as well. Um, mm. I think um, I say to them all, look, this is this is going to be too difficult if, to have any kind of rancor in the uh, in the rehearsal room or in the process. Yeah, you do this because you want to. You do this because you're part of my team. Um, you do this because you want to and you believe in it. Um, I think that's very important. It, it, it can't just be a job. A ring cycle for anyone involved in it can't just be a job. You know, yeah. you can't just get up and go to a 10 o'clock call and leave at five o'clock and say, OK, well, job done. Bye. It's too... Um, it's too difficult. <laughs> well, it's totally immersive, isn't it? I mean, you have to carry this energy through through uh, four operas entirely. Yeah, and we've only got through one so far. <laughs> All right, let's get so let's get to the really exciting news. I want to hear some of these reviews. Can you just give me some points of the reviews you've had since your opening night? And you know, this is so important, Ben, because you you you're not going away. I mean, the, in the UK, in Europe, and even now here, we realize that Ben Woodward has done something really significant and needs to be recognized. So let's let's share in some of the better part of the review. Well, the nice, I mean, I'm, uh, it's, it's quite, uh, the Guardian one says, uh, Ben Woodward's chamber arrangement of Wagner's score works well and, uh, and players and singers alike ensure a vivid experience. I mean, that's what we're going to, for as yeah. well. Yeah. Um, and I think that kind of encapsulates another thing that we, we've been doing since 2010, 2011, is the um, very close by thing. The audience are very close by. That was one th the one thing we kind of lost in Meistersinger, doing it in a Pross Arch Theatre, was you didn't quite feel that, you know, there was still a pit in the way. And yeah, stuff. so you the intimacy, yeah. The intimacy, but we have, bizarrely, and going to this enormous venue, um, we've got that back because once again the audience are right right in the heart of the action so i was quite pleased with what the guardian said in that regard and it also uh you know <laughs> it also says how we were putting together our ring cycle ambitious in a slightly bonkers way i mean mm -hmm. it's ab that's absolutely it um uh 
the um what did the times say uh, I mean, the Times mentioned our great imagination and Herculean fundraising uh, to get this far with nothing like the resources of the country's big stage companies and no public subsidy. Right. Um, and that's that's a big something as well. Um, I say the ENO story uh, is is a very tricky story. I mean, the, um, uh, the I think from my perspective, the slightly more interesting thing about it is I live in Germany and I've done now three contracts at German opera houses mm -hmm. where it's almost 100% public subsidy. Um, it's part of the German constitution to have these theatres mm -hmm. that you go and the the taxpayer's purse is paying the million dollars for the um, for the production. It's like, which possibly feels weird to some people. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But say, so we, we don't have that. So... Um, what else have people said? Um, uh, this last one that's come in today in London unattached. Um, I think this this reviewer actually really understands, has figured out what we're doing. She says, um, director Caroline Staunton's production aims to center the emotional arcs of the central characters playing down the mythical archetypes of gods and dwarves. And then she goes to explain it all, It's which a reviewer actually opening her eyes yeah. and realising what's in front of her, which was, that's pleasing when they actually get it. Yeah, oh, totally. I mean, 100%. <laughs> and so that brings me to my next question. I mean, it, is this really, and we've talked about this for a couple of years now over here in the United States, but is this the future of opera as it needs to be? Um, We're at a, um, well... We're at a very strange place in world history. I mean, this, the 2020s will certainly be written about in in yeah. history books. Um, the Nobody's got any money, um, and this is the challenge. Or, or the rich have got more money, and the sort of middle class and poor have got very little. Um, and the places governments tend to cut, first of all, is the arts, because that's an easy thing to do. Um, it, and that's kind of doesn't make a lot of sense because if you've got none of that enjoyment none of that kind of well we're going out for the evening let's go to the opera mm -hmm. if that isn't there then what's the point yeah um mm -hmm. wh why are you going to work and doing your nine to five every day if you can't go to the opera in the evening um so it's um we're, we're at a very strange time and I have to put this stuff on. I I often mention a, a slightly strange quote, which I only I think it's a I think it's Jean Luc Picard take, doing a, doing a, a Michelangelo quote actually. <laughs> why does a painter sculpt paint? Why does a sculptor sculpt? Um, and the answer is because he has to. Um, mm -hmm. I have to put this stuff on, and this is the way I can do it. Um, I would very much like to be general music director at Deutsche Oper or the Royal Opera House or anywhere like this so that I could do it in, you know, lavish ways where the production budget was seven figures and, you know, whatever else. But right now I don't have that, so I'm going to do it anyway. I love that. <laughs> you, know, you have just superseded my next question, which is something I've talked about a lot on my show with various artists. Someone asked me one day, you know, what is it about all these artists you interview, Pam? What What is the one denominator? And I said, without hesitation, some artists are called. We're, we're literally called like a, a religious experience. And you've just said that because you have to. Mm -hmm. And so now, Ben Woodward, what will happen if you are suddenly called in a different way, that you're, you're offered a, a job at at the Staatsoper in, in Berlin, or, uh, you know, e even going to Bee House, perhaps, in Germany, or back to the UK? Would it take well, the life out of you, actually, to, to do a job like that? I'm not, well, I've done several, uh, several uh, German theatre jobs, as I say. I've been a repetitor and um, with conducting responsibilities is the way they roughly translate it. Mm -hmm. um, at, a at a couple of German houses, um, if I got to, if I was 
if I suddenly got told, oh, actually, we're not having, I forget what the guy's name is, the next Papano at the Royal Opera House is going to be me, um, <laughs> I'd A, be fine with that. <laughs> um, but um, Finally, you don't have to fundraise anymore. Yeah. yeah. We have people to do the fundraising, thank goodness. Um, I mean, first and foremost, I am a musician. And the place where I feel happiest, most at home, is standing on the podium in front of a bunch of musicians and making that drama happen. Mm -hmm. um, this particular ring cycle, where we've all, the fact that we've already got now sort of about, what would I say, a fifth, a fifth of the way through it, realistically, in terms of hours, mm -hmm. um, uh, this is not going anywhere. I am not going to take on any job that stops me from finishing this project. Perfect. Um, this is important. Something about this is special. Mm -hmm. um, also, is. also, my wife doesn't get on stage until the next opera, so we can't stop yet. <laughs> <laughs> that means you really have to finish out with Good Adonia. Okay. Well, absolutely. So, um, no, this it's. Um, I, I would love a job that. I, the, 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 this also comes at great personal cost, and I think that um, mm -hmm. that your other artists, the, the common denominator is, do you know what? If they don't know where the next. Um, the next meal is going to come from. Right. Then uh, they're still going to do it anyway. Yeah, that's right. That's, um, that's right. So there's that. That's that's the thing. We we have, you know, I, I'd love to be taking a huge salary from well, frankly, almost anything, mm -hmm. but um, but right now, I am the last person to get paid on this job. Right. Um, which is ridiculous. Um, it's a very, it's a very, it, as I say, it comes at great personal cost and great personal risk. But as I said at the end of a Guardian article that I wrote, I'm so, I'm, I'm sorry, Edda, thanks for the warning, but we're going to do it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that is brilliant. That is absolutely, that just sums you up right there. I, I love that, Ben. Yeah. Oh my good Lord. Okay. So. We've got Ryan Gold down. You have a couple more performances, and yep. then you go on in a couple of months to do Valkyrie. Um, yeah, Valkyrie is on. Uh, we start rehearsing in April. Um, uh, we've already been spending a lot of time with Kiel and Kat, uh, working just on the text of the very difficult middle section and very end sections of that. So that's already kind of in the works. The arrangement is about 70% complete. Uh, when I go back to Berlin on Tuesday, I will start, you know, I shall start trying to get that finished up. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I also have a variety of orchestral repertoire workshops coming up. Uh, one on Carmen, one on Electra, one on um, Love of Three Oranges, which I should probably actually learn. <laughs> uh, it, it might behoove you, yes. Um, and we're doing a tour next year of Cosi Fan Tutte, which um, that'll just that'll be a little joy in itself. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I'd also like to mention the CD which we brought out with it. Um, we've um, back in uh, back at the start of this calendar year, we did a uh, a big crowdfund and successfully crowdfunded about twenty six thousand um, pounds, which was enough to hire the orchestra and a proper recording company, recording label, um, to record five of these big Wagner and excerpts uh, with this particular, in these arrangements. Um, and that is now out on Takata Classics. That's that's an important that thing is. I need to say. And on all of your fav favourite streaming services, Wagner by Arrangement, it's called. Wagner by Arrangement. How exciting. You're mm -hmm. on a roll, Ben Woodward. We're, We're pushing really it. We're on a roll, I've got to say. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I need to ask you this. You, you're you speaking about the German system and you now living in Berlin. You know, how much does that, that fire your soul? The fact that the arts is in the skin of the people. In other words, they're paying for it all the time. It's this conscious decision to, to support the arts. You, I mean, is it a great thing to be in Berlin right now? Um. Berlin is a marvellous city. I mean, I've been very lucky to, in my life to have lived in four of the greatest cities in the world. Um, New York, London, Manchester, and now Berlin. Um, it's been... It is in the German constitution that they will support the arts. Yeah. 
Um, and that is something they feel very passionately about. Um, and they educate their kids about this from a very early age. Um, and the, so I've seen Hansel and Gretel at the Ham, Hanover Staatsoper, um, where there were 900 children in the, in the building. Um, watching that and when the conductor came on stage to take his bow they all applauded him like he was Justin Bieber it was it yeah. was like a crazy thing similarly I've seen uh, German kids going and watching brand new pieces of contemporary opera that I found very difficult to listen to um, I watched a Moby Dick that had just been written full of kids um, and this sort of trickles through. If you get in a cab in Berlin and say, say to the cabbie, oh yeah, I'm off to the opera, they'll probably say, oh, are you seeing Rigoletto? Are you seeing this? <laughs> Which ca Do you prefer this cast or this cast? Um, oh my gosh. And it, it trickles down through the mm -hmm. whole of society. Mm -hmm. um, this love of, well, all art really, but particularly in Germany for, for what I see of it is, is, the, uh, is opera, so. It's um, and it, that is quite inspiring. Um, I did write a paper on a proposal to suggest that Britain ad adopts the same system, but you know, <laughs> I can't it might have fallen it. on deaf ears in recent <laughs> that, might, that might that might have gone straight down the uh, proverbial yes. But 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 that may change. Fantastic for you. Wow. This is a great interview. Look, um, <laughs> so, you know, all these study programs you do on weekends, like you mentioned to Strauss's The Egyptian Helen. An yes. insane piece. And over two days, yeah, you put yep. together your orchestra and, and you have your singers and you just move your way through it. And everybody is left with this indelible mark of being able to perform this piece, which is rarely ever performed. Yeah. Yeah. We've so our our orchestra days are some of the most fun I have, actually. We do them three times a year. Um usually on enormous pieces. Um so I have done We've done act by act the entire ring cycle. Um, I've now done. I've now conducted six Strauss operas um, in various bits, uh, including Frau and Schatten, which is just you know, nobody fringe opera would take on Frau and Schatten. Of course, of course they wouldn't. Yeah, because it's huge. Um, but we spend a weekend fighting our way through these pieces. Um, it gives the cast a chance to to learn these roles, um, mm -hmm. to feel what it feels like to sing with a full orchestra. Um, I will say my, <laughs> my gratitude to the people who fix this orchestra for me. Um, it's so, they put in so much effort to, to find an 80 piece symphony orchestra for me to stand in front right. of for a weekend. Right, um, right. And that is such a privilege. Um, and for, it varies hugely whether we make a nice sound or not. <laughs> it's you know it's it's people sort of semi pros and good amateurs who are in this orchestra, but they would never otherwise get to play Frau Schatten or Egyptische Helena. Um, we've also done Yennefer, which was totally new to me. Um, what else? We did Peter Grimes. There's you know huge numbers of pieces which we've done just to try and feel them in our bones. Uh, for a weekend. Mm -hmm. so, well um, said. Well said. Your resume has become quite long, Ben Woodward. <laughs> yes, that's good. I said I would still quite like a job. <laughs> I would say you're ripe for the poaching at this point. Well, um, it would be the greatest loss, actually, to the future of opera, because I, I do firmly believe that there is life in the small companies that we cannot find anywhere else, as you've just so eloquently talked about this past hour. It's fantastic. And I wish you all the luck now. After Valkyrie, when are we seeing Siegfried? Um, so Siegfried is February 2024. Okay. Um, my Siegfried is one of three people who, uh, so there are three people. There's Ollie Gibbs, the Siegfried is Philip Medinos, uh, mm -hmm. big Greek tenor. And then uh, Justine, I, I almost, I, I forgot about her. I've just realized this week actually, that she was one of the people who was in the 2014 ring. Um, so those three are the only three people from the 2014 ring who are doing this one. Okay. Um, but Siegfried, yeah, Philip is coming back. Um, uh, with all these things, you know, artists, we have our ups and down times. And 
Mm-hmm. Philip has had his fair share of tricky times as as a voice, as an artist. But I've believed in him the whole way. I think his Siegfried is astonishing. Um, I, he's a properly big guy, and he's also a train, trained swordsman. So, ah! <laughs> and indeed, he's a fight director himself. As one of the things he does, he does fight direction. So he really knows how to look good wielding a sword. And... <laughs> Um, I love this. Oh so my that, god. You're getting a two for one here. I love he's this. Is too great. Good. He's he makes a lot of noise. Um and then um and then Goethe Denrung, we're not gonna do Goethe Denrung on its own. Um it doesn't having done that in 2013, <laughs> we realise that doesn't make a lot of financial sense. Because what happens is if you're if you tell people you're going to do a ring cycle, they tend not to come to the Goethe Denrung on its own. They really? tend to they tend to wait and just come to the Goethe Denrung as part of a ring cycle. Okay. So this may be an insane idea. I mean, it, it may may come and bite us back in the ass. But um, he um, at the end of twenty twenty four, we're going to give two complete ring cycles, adding the Goethe Denrung onto the previous three. It's going to exhaust the orchestra. It's going to exhaust me. Um, uh, one of the main goals we've actually written it as part of our, you know, our kind of SWOT diagram. Uh, the goal is to is to remain married to the Brunhilde. <laughs> um, um, no question about that. Yes. <laughs> it's um, it's doing these things is stupidly stressful. Doing a ring cycle is a mad mad thing to undertake, but it's got to be done. So we're gonna do it. It's got to be done, and you are the guy. I am telling you from Don Carlo to Falstaff to uh, Arabella to Yennefer. I mean, you're doing it. You, I'm doing it. I, I do. I, I, I like, I mean, fundamentally, I, I, pres- I presume I do this because I love the music. <laughs> I, think, I think this music, I don't think I've had any pieces that I have put on that I haven't believed in. If I believe in the music, then I will make them happen. Um, so, and that's that's one of the funny things about this kind of negative thing about being in a German opera house. German opera houses, you put so much on, you just put so much onto the mm-hmm. stage, mm-hmm. and people often say, "Well, that was a bit of a turkey. Um, that was, you know, not a not a great piece to have spent all that time, effort, and money on." And I've never felt that with one of the pieces I I put on. I always absolutely absolutely believe in these pieces. I mean, they are all masterpieces. There's no two ways about it. Um, and um, bring, bringing back Egyptian Helena, which had almost never been done in the UK, that was a joy, because it is a joyous piece. Um, and I mean, it's difficult as hell, but um, look at it, you, you've we, made your mark. We do I, the thing. We I do will the... hang on tight, Ben, because your vision still needs to persevere, and we need to be watching. Are you getting the recognition for this now that you think you deserve? I'm. Um, I hope this will make that happen. Yeah. Um, I, I, it, it's this business is so strange. Um, the people who make it to the top are not necessarily the people who are best at it. It is not a meritocracy. Right. Um, it is about if you're. I mean, the same is true in any business. I, I realize that you know the. Um, you've got to be in the right place at the right time. You've got to have a little bit of luck. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And I am working extremely hard to make all this happen um i would i would love to conduct at the royal opera absolutely i would love to conduct the met i would love to conduct all over the world and that hasn't really happened for me yet but maybe this will bring me the attention that um that makes that happen uh it's gonna be it's it's gonna be an interesting few years one thing i do know even if you are taken onto the met stage to conduct you are never going to part from Regents Opera and these magnificent projects that you do on your own where where you all have artistic control, which I think is is fantastic and rare. Mm. Control and also ownership, I think, is important. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Try, try and give a bit of that ownership to everyone who's in it so yeah, that yeah. they believe in it. Um, I think it's very important. So. Well, we believe in you, Ben. Oh, honey. <laughs> All right. So if I have to ask you, is there one word or phrase that really sums up from the heart who you are, what you are, 
<laughs> what would that be? Uh, uh, what comes to your mind? Just bonkers. Clearly mad. <laughs> <laughs> clearly mad. <laughs> <laughs> misguided that is the end to this interview <laughs> absolutely you are. Uh, yes and we need bonkers people and we need those who are completely mad to take on the impossible projects that you're introducing to us ben go on forever please don't ever ever let this enthusiasm of yours die down well done we're gonna do the thing how do people find tickets for the ring in london at freemasons hall um uh, so the ticket link is ticketsource.co.uk slash regents hyphen opera. Mm -hmm. um, you'll find a link to that on regentsopera.com, but the ticket link directly is at ticketsource.co.uk. Um, you can find that there. You say you can find the the, um, the CD. You can listen to it and download it on all your favorite streaming services on, uh, say, Wagner by Arrangement. The um, Yeah, and you can find me at benwoodconductor.com. Perfect. Perfect. Ben, all the best. I, I know you're going to have the biggest success with this project and, and we'll, we'll all wait to hear. It's just so exciting. And thanks for taking the time to share with me. Absolutely. You are tenacious and you got that thing, boy, just emanating from, you know, your solar plexus of passion. <laughs> I love it. I love mad, it. Mad, mad, mad. <laughs> Good. Bad. Stay mad and thank you, darling. And to everyone out there, I want to ask you to stay safe in these crazy times and remain bonkers like Ben Woodward when he takes on a project. This is Pamela Kuhn and the curtain is now down on Center Stage. <laughs>